That's all right. We'll get into the Word a little bit this evening and get you all out of here in a reasonable amount of time. How many of y'all watched Coffee with the Colonel this morning? If you, oh, yeah, that's why y'all are here. Oh, the preacher's going to talk about love tonight. He ain't going to be beating nobody up or nothing. Uh, <laughs> y'all wait. Let me show you what real love looks like. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> hey, it's good to have everybody. How many of y'all been enjoying this nice West Texas breeze? I can't believe it. All my buddies are in Arizona team roping. They're all locked in the house. Water's running right down with Wickenburg. I mean, it's raining all over the place, and and uh, here we sit out here in the land of enchantment. And, and uh, yeah, that's in Texas. The other side's the land of entrapment. No, not, not really, not really. Just got to get my politics in there right quick. So, anyhow, uh, I really don't have no big opening thing tonight. I think if we get right in the Word, the Word tonight's going to cover everything we need to cover tonight. We're going to be writing uh, Revelation 2 again. We're going to continue to talk about the church in Ephesus and forsaking your first love tonight. We're just going to read down through there and see how the Holy Spirit guides us. If you don't have a Bible, I see one grabbing a Bible. Somebody need a Bible, get you a Bible. Let me. I haven't given this little talk in a long time, and then we'll keep it real short. Be sure you got a Bible. And I know a lot of people like to do it on their phone, and I know some of you can mark stuff and do things fancy with your phones, but if you're not equipped to do fancy stuff with your phone, get you a, a Bible like, like one of these right here with a cover, and then get you one of these as an ink pen. And I don't care what your grandma told you, write in it. Mark your spots, underline stuff, reference things. Study your Bible. If you're any able at all, because what I tell you on a Wednesday night is not enough. That's enough to get you warmed up. If you catch a little coffee with the colonel six days a week, that'll get you a little bit warmed up. But to actually go sit down with your word, in the beginning was the word. The word was God, and the word was with God. And the word came in the flesh and made his dwelling among us. And so this... This right here, look, for all how many of y'all how many of y'all felt like today the world was a little haywire? Anybody had any haywire today? I'm gonna tell you, my second break, I went in the office and I told the girls, I said, the cattle or a zoo, we had one of every kind. I'm surprised we didn't have one come in with his tongue hanging out under his tail. I mean, we had one of every kind. And the and the and the people in the sale barn was the same way. They was just all over the place, and just it was cold, and the wind blowing, and all kind of stuff. And uh, then then if you time it just right, there's a guy out back that smokes a little cannabis. I won't tell you how I recognize the smell, but it just comes right through the door with the cow manure and everything else. And uh, <laughs> Charlie, he said, "Are you running out of air?" I said, "No, I'm inhaling." <laughs> Sit back. <laughs> you're, you're blocking the breeze. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> oh, we got to laughing about it. I told him, I said, it's kind of funny. On my way home, I got to stop and get a bag of chips, and by the time I get to far wheel, I've got a headache. <laughs> but all day long, my memory got better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, my God, who can talk like this in church? It's about time somebody did because there's a plenty of haywire stuff, ain't it? Plenty of haywire stuff. That's why you got to have your word. Your word will keep you on plumb. Your word will keep you focused. Your word will keep your eyes on Jesus and the kingdom of God and not all the silliness and the chaos and the upside downness and the rottenness and the evilness that goes on in a world that's lost and going straight to hell. They're all going right straight to hell, going to bust the gates wide open. We're not special because we're going to heaven. We're, we're different because we're born again. And we dwell in the kingdom. The kingdom dwells with us. And this word will help you stay focused. Let me tell you something. Anybody tells me they're hearing from God and hearing the Holy Spirit and they're not a student of the word, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Till I see some proof in it. Now, I know some people who have been able to hear God who wasn't students of the Word. There's been very few of them. 
But if you want to discern the voices, probably ought to get some of this on you now. And uh, you know, we're going. This is going to become more necessary. Yeah. You do. You know why y'all are here? You chose to be here, but God chose you first. And then you answered. And I'm predicting over a period of time without any self-addressed envelopes or any pomp and circumstance, I think we're going to continue to have intelligent, wage-earning, land-owning, patriotic, Jesus-loving people are going to step right out of the institutions of religion one by one. It's hard to do. And you're going to show up here. I'm not arrogant in that, but I, 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 I don't know very. I just don't know very many people who stand up here and tell what God wants told without worrying about offense or worrying about all that old stuff. So you hear because we're gonna get prepared to go out there. Listen, it's safer to hang out in here. They're jacked up out there. Yeah, they're upside down. They want you to be upside down too. <laughs> so we got to come in here and work on this stuff a little bit so we can kind of survive it, make a difference, turn some things in our discretion right side up, stay involved in the things of the day so the next batch doesn't have to fall for all the craziness and the stupidity and the stuff. So just a handful of us. But we all got a big job to do when we get out of here. There's a big mess to clean up. We all just go clean up our little part, do what we can, keep our family in sync, stay plumb. But without this, it's impossible. It's just flat impossible. So that's why when you come here, we're just going to read the Bible. Then we're going to talk about it. And when you come back next week, we're just going to read the Bible. Been reading the Bible for 20 years right here. So bring your Bible. Be sure you got a Bible. Get one of these. La Pluma. La Pluma. Yeah, get you a pen. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you for tonight. Thank you for the word that you're going to bring tonight, Lord, and the insight to your word, your letters to the church, Lord. That's us. We need to hear from you. And so, Lord, we just pray and ask you to guide us tonight, speak to us tonight, give revelation tonight, that, Lord, we this would sink in and take root. We're all here tonight, Lord, because we need you, and we need help. There's a world out there that just doesn't agree with us. And so, Lord, we need to know how to function in that. So show us how tonight. Your church, speak to your church, your people as you said you would. We give you all the praise tonight, Jesus, all the glory. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen. All right, when you get over here in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 2, I'm going to read this letter again. You know, and last week I had some notes and everything about lampstands, and man, I did a good job. I had a really good little old message ready last week, and then got to reading there, and the Holy Spirit messed all that up. But we had a really good time last week in the Lord just discussing what God says to us, the seven facets of the church, the things that are good, the things that are bad, the things we need to change, the things we recognize about ourselves. If you wasn't here last week, we're not going to do what Christians have done for the last 140 years reading these seven letters. We're not going to choose which one is which denomination. We're not going to point over here and go, oh, that's them. That's them. No, these seven letters are for me. So while I read this letter to me, you decide if this letter is written to you. And whatever God speaks to me about me, he's done that so I can share that with you. Everybody will find their own little spot and their own little niche and their own things that need to change or shift. I'm just the guinea pig that 20 years ago said, yes, I'll do this. 
And this is the only way I know to do it. This is life application. It's my testimony. It's the, what God shows me. Now you take that word and you do the same. You look at the mirror of the word. Go home tonight and read James one twenty two down. That he who looks in the mirror of the word and turns away immediately forgets what he saw. But the man who looks into the mirror of the word and does what it says, he'll be blessed in whatever he does. Recognizing ourselves in this Bible. That's what we've done in a lot of church settings over the last several decades. We've taught this as a story. Truly done it to the Old Testament, just taught it as some kind of history lesson. <laughs> when it was God interacting with man who was trying to interact with God the whole time, it was a great place to learn some life lessons. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're doing tonight. So he says right here in chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, Ephesus right. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. That sounds like good church right there. Man, we're working hard. We're doing right. And we do not like stuff that's wrong. <laughs> and you've tested those who say they're apostles and not. Found them to be liars. And you've persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. Nevertheless, how many of us, you reckon God's got a nevertheless? In all the good we've done and as hard as we've tried, you reckon our Father in heaven could just sit down with us nice and easy, not as a big bad guy with a stick going to whack you over the head, but just a guy talking to you so your life would get better. You're doing good in these areas, nevertheless. I'll give you a good example. I, uh, Austin, he was over there Sunday. In fact, old Austin, he cracked out when him were open over there Sunday. But my little Rome Mayor, Robin's little Rome Mayor worked good, didn't she? Real good. So I sent a video to a guy because we're wanting to maybe take her and show her and do some stuff. And I sent him the video, and I said, look at this. Judge this video. Well, she does this, 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 and this, but nevertheless, <laughs> we've got to fix a couple little things for her to be truly successful. Doesn't that make sense? We're this, 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 and this, but nevertheless... Those neverthelesses is what's kept me up here telling my story and repenting in front of you people for 20 years because every, it seemed like every time God has a nevertheless with me. It just doesn't seem to be very many days. He said, man, you were 100% today. There's always this little nevertheless. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. One of the things, and here's one of the things, thank you, Jesus. Wasn't going to hit on this tonight, but I'm going to for just a second. There are things that God hates. There are things that God calls an abomination. That word means disgusting. If it's disgusting to God, it should be disgusting to us. I know the first thing that comes to everybody's mind. Homosexuality. The Bible says it's disgusting. But just so you know, so is your man-made religion. Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10 is real clear on that. Same word. 
Same word that he uses for sleeping with a goat or a man sleeping with a man or a man who's having idol type worship. It's all disgusting. How many of us have picked and chosen which things we want to hate? Which things do we hate more? Come on, I'm working out my nevertheless here. I've tried to hate them all equally, and then I leaked. Because if I simply walk around doing the work and hating the Nicolaitans, if I simply walk around to do the work and do all the things, and but I don't love, I don't remember my first love, then you're going to do what I did in one of the phases that some of y'all sit through and the rest of them left. You'll preach angry, and if you're not the preacher, you'll just live angry. Boy, you don't think God doesn't know what's going on. I didn't take any notes tonight. God watched our lives all day today. There's things going on in our world, and it's starting to get really close to home. Right under our noses that we hate. Yet in the letters to the churches, we've been playing church since Moby Dick was a minute, and God hated most of that too. He doesn't dwell in buildings built by human hands, and He hates when you say He does. You found some that said they were apostles and prophets and all this stuff. And you smelt them out. Well, guess what God said? He said, I knew them before you did. We got a lot of crazy stuff going on. It's not enough to hate what's evil. It's not enough to do the work. He said, the nevertheless in this scripture for me is, do you remember your first love? Do you remember the height from which you're falling? And I guarantee you most people on the first swing that call themselves Christians don't even know what their first love was. We all know the can answer. Jesus. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, who or what did you love before you found him? And was it because of that love that you found him and he restored the things you loved right back to you and now you love him because he first loved you? That's how the Bible reads. That's the scripture text in this. Do you remember what it was that you were trying to reclaim when you cried out to Jesus? Because if you do, and you reclaimed it, and God gave it back to you, why wouldn't you wake up every morning and say, thank you, Jesus, for this life I've been given. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunities I've been given. Thank you, Jesus, for the breath I'm breathing. Thank you, Jesus, that I can get up and I can have dreams, desires, and hopes, and I want to do things, and I have potential. I've been blessed with gifts and talents and, and a world of opportunity. Because Jesus Christ reconciled my life back unto himself. And one night I died and the same night I was raised up. Don't tell me you got the joy of the Lord and the love of Christ if you're not thankful. Because thankfulness is the breeding ground for all of that. A grateful heart. Well, my life sucks. Really? got enough wherewithal to be here tonight or you turned on something to watch this which part's so bad where were you at when you found Jesus because here in a minute I'm going to take you over to 1 John chapter 4 and we're going to talk about some things tonight that might mess some people up you know that old song just give me that old time religion you mean something about hellfire and brimstone? 
Did you pray a prayer and blow some snot because you were afraid of hell? Or did you beg Jesus to take your life because you knew He was your only hope to get it back? Which one? They used to do this in jail all the time. You know, I followed some guys around, get some old guy in jail. They, look, if you're in jail, you know you've screwed up. All you got to do is look down at your feet that don't have no real shoes and you know something's the matter. <laughs> Boys, you need to repent or you're going to hell. You need to get saved or you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. I mean, y'all believe hell's a real place? Yeah. So, did you call on Jesus because you were afraid? Or did you call on Jesus because you were in need? You call on him because you're in need of forgiveness, hope, restoration, a new life. Out of his love for us, he makes that happen. When that happens, what happens for us? A new claimed affection for the one who first loved us. We can stand around and have our panties in a wad over the stupid stuff. I mean, honest to God, all you got to do is stop and buy a tank of diesel and you see how stupid the world is. You don't even have to go inside. They're everywhere. And so take it from a guy who does not want to die, a grumpy old white guy. I've been trying to listen to the never, nevertheless. I know you hate what the Nick ladies do. I know you hate some of this stuff. I hate it too. And one day he'll destroy it all. All of it. The only part that won't be destroyed is his holy temple. And you and I that are born again are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The house of the living God. And so don't forget your first love. Don't forget the height from which you've fallen. That scripture has been my favorite one during all this since COVID, all the elevated horse prices. I mean, it's just been crazy. About five years ago or so, I was at Wickenburg, Arizona, and we sold a team roping horse for $80,000. It's the first team rope. I've been doing every team roping horse sale pretty much. Or there's some, not every one of them, but I've been doing them now since 1994, and I'm the one guy that's been the whole time. And... uh and when we sold that one for about 80000 I was in every magazine. That was a big deal. That was the highest team roping horse that had ever been sold in public auction. The next year, we sell one for 90 and two for over 100 and Nobody even takes a note. Then a, three or four, about three years ago, Western Horseman did a little article on me, and, and we were doing a little interview, and he said, what's the highest horse you ever sold? And I said, well... I think there was a broodmare one day for about 600000 and I said, I sold a colt the other day named Tin Man. I sold him for half a million dollars. So about five or 600 somewhere in there. And they said, you think you'll ever sell one for a million? And I said, nah, I'm kind of an old guy. I'm down to the last chapter of the deal, I think. I'm probably about maxed out and blah, 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 blah. And we get down there to Fort Worth. Next thing that happens is I sell a little filly that's by the name of Would She Be Tough, and she brings a million fifty. Next thing you know, I'm an ever magazine is then the next year we sell Woody B. Tough her dad for a million three okay this year we sell a filly for a million two come back the next day sell a two year old stud for a million five and the day after that we sell a yearling stud coat for 985,000 that's within spitting distance of a million nobody cares <laughs> Everybody's got a million-dollar horse now. Nobody cares. 
So here's the question, all of them. They'll get you off in the men's bathroom. Hey, what about this horse business? What do you think? I said, well, let me give you some wise words from a father. Don't forget the height from which you've fallen. <laughs> you boys are getting pretty high up there. It's a long ways to the bottom. How many of y'all ever done it in the cattle business? Yeah. Got to contract your wheat. <laughs> it's going up. I ain't selling out. <laughs> Don't forget the height from which you've fallen. The highest point in your life. The highest point in your life was the day you realized what Jesus had done for you. The next one was the day you woke up and wanted to do it for somebody else. You've been doing all the right stuff. You hate all the right stuff. But you forgot how to love. Can you remember that your most needy day, desperate day, the day you wanted Jesus to come into your life and help you remanage everything you had going on, that you felt like the rope was slipping through your hand and you're about to hit the knot. And Jesus helped you get both hands on the rope. Get it back. And the day you realize you got it back. Hey, I got a second chance. I got a second chance. You realize what Jesus had actually done for you. Now all of a sudden you're so full. You want to tell somebody. Here's where the nevertheless hit Steve Frisco right on the forehead. I was doing all the right stuff for his namesake. I even learned to hate all the right stuff. Next thing you know, I'm telling people the good news of Jesus Christ because I'm right. It's out your amen. I'm not the only one in the house. There's plenty of us that have screwed up Thanksgiving dinner because <laughs> we were right. We've tore up a lot of stuff because we was right. I forget what day it happened that I quit telling the story of what my Lord purchased back for me. You see, the first time I ever really met him face to face, all I wanted was my family. That's it. I already had a job. I already had a bank account. I already had a new pickup. But I was on a trail that was going to mess everything up. And I wasn't so dumb that I didn't know it. That's all Jesus asked me that night in the tray. He didn't say nothing about heaven. He didn't say nothing about hell. He said, what do you want? What do you love the most? I was telling you about the guys in the jail. That's how. This is how I ministered to the guys in the jail in Allen. We, we did it. First thing I'd ask you, guy, when he come out the jail cell, if they come out for a little Bible study or prayer, one of them old big, tough, head-shaved ink pads, Standing there, I said, hey, you got a family? That's all you got to say. Hey, bud, you got a family? Nine out of ten. Here it come. Trickling down that cheek. All you got to do is find somebody that loves something more than themselves. They love something more than themselves. And when they start to lose it, if it's redeemable, Jesus will redeem it. And he'll show you how to walk in it. 
and to hold on to it and to grow in it. You see, we love him because he first loved us. But my story, he was not my first love. My first love was my family. And I cried out to Jesus, and he helped me re- fix that, to get on a better path. And when I realized what Jesus was doing for me, I began to love him, not because a Sunday school teacher told me I was supposed to love Jesus. I, anything you do with this that you think you're supposed to, quit it. Do it because you want to, and that's because that's what's happening and for real in your life. You fall in love with Jesus. You fall in love with Jesus. Look over here, and and let's go to 1 John chapter 4. Just over to the left a little bit. 1 John chapter 4. Wayne Dandy, you remember when I first started preaching at Sale Barn 100 years ago? I just wanted all my buddies to meet the guy that was saving my life. That's all I wanted. Then we did that around the sale barn, and then we was going to fix everybody's mess around here in town, and then pretty soon we're going to fix the town. Now we're going to fix the whole United States of America, and pretty soon we're going to fix the church, and I'm, I'm just going to fix everything. Just I got me a Jesus tool belt on. You just tell me what's screwed up, and I'm going to fix it. Best I can tell, I didn't fix nothing. Wore out a couple new pickups or three or four. Successfully preached a place empty a time or two. Got a few folks where they don't want to, they see me coming, they try to get in the other aisle of the grocery store. Yeah, good job, coach. Yeah. Because the true church has to know how to do this because the power, the power is in the love. And 2020 was the great revealer. I've said that the whole time. 2023, I believe, is going to be the kingdom revealer. And I believe that's why we're all here in this pile, watching on that thing. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Love did that. Boldness in the day of judgment. How many of you, without a raising of your hands, how many of you a little squeamish about the day of judgment? Them wheels are already turning and you hadn't got past morning. Oh, shoot. I got some stuff I got to fix. <laughs> Love has made us bold in the day of judgment. Stand up and look our sin in the face. Look the things that come against us in the face because of the love of Christ that's in us. We know what Jesus has done for us. We know. It's not somebody else's story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Jesus all the day long. What He's done for me and continues to do in me and for me, that continues to elevate my affection towards Him. And it's all because He first loved me. And that love perfected everything in me that I can even face the judgment. Now, if I'm bold towards the judgment, then why would I shrink back from anything else? Because judgment is heaven and hell. Heaven and hell is not about praying a prayer and blowing some snot and getting your ticket punched. Heaven and hell is about the judgment. Sheep to the right and goats to the left. Matthew 25. So he says, because as he is, so are we in the world. What? As he is, so are we in the world. 
Where is the one place in Scripture two times, and they all happened on the same day, that you caught Jesus in a bad mood? Remember him making a little trip to the temple? You remember an old fig tree that wasn't doing its part? Cursed it, didn't he? Then what'd he do? He went in an abomination and turned everything upside down. But that's it. Jesus did not run around town telling everybody what a bunch of idiots they were. He cast demons out of the demonized. Without reprimand, he sat right at the well with a harlot and didn't condemn her. What did he tell her? You can have life. This water I give, well, you'll never thirst again. What happened? She went to town and told everybody, didn't she? Yeah. Look, y'all getting this in real time. I don't have any of that wrote down. He said, as he is, so we are in the world. Again, I know I'm the only one here, but I have a nevertheless there. Because I'm a knothead. I know what's right and know what's wrong. And people think I'm bold because I don't mind saying it. But if I have not love when I open my mouth, according to 1 Corinthians 13, what am I? Clanging cymbal. How many of y'all ever had a kid want to play the drums? How many of y'all built another house for your kid that wanted to play the drums? Outside. <laughs> yeah. That's how the world does with us. See, I'm not of this world, but I'm in it. I am the only hope for this world of darkness to have light. As y'all are too. So if I'm a clanging symbol, do I still know right from wrong? Yes. Can I still address the subject? Yes, when asked. But I got to do it in love. So y'all going to have to bear with me while I work on this because it's been going on now for about three months and there's people out there. I got guys and buddies and they, I've gone soft. Turned into a weenie. Oh, I still get just as mad as the next guy. Just trying to figure out how to Try to do this one. I got this one highlighted. Because of love is perfected in me. Because as he is, we are in the world. I need to I need to read that one every day. I probably need to read it three or four times a day. There is no fear in love. This is good stuff. But perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. You and I were blessed to live in a time in, in the human race where people found a way to use things to torment other people, to use things to create fear. And the great revealer was there was a whole group of people on the face of the earth who called themselves Christians. Do you know why they called themselves Christians? Because they were doing all the right things. They were doing the work. They were calling out apostles. They, they, were, they hated the works of the Nicolaitans. They're doing all the right things. And then all of a sudden, the world stands up and shoots fear through a fire hose. And we stop what we're doing on a Sunday morning, and everybody decides to get a drink. Is 
God, it gets quiet. If the church has been born again out of the perfect love of Jesus, and if truly everything necessary for life and godliness has been given to us, and I've realized that, then I return the same amount of love to Christ that he gave to me. If perfect love casts out all fear, then who were we? Now, I'm not talking about us because I kind of know how it went around here. We didn't have a lot of backup in us. But that, again, was part of the problem. When you can smell what they're stepping in, it's easy to get your fight on. You remember me telling one time? It was bad advice. I said, you know what's wrong with the church in America? Most of them ain't never been in a bar fight. Man, maybe you should have went to the bar before you went to church, got in a fight, and got up and got knocked down again. Mm, that was probably a dumb thing to say. But I had my fight on. There's an enemy was trying to get us. I knew it. I preached it, and I told it, and guess what? I was right. And I hated what was going on. I'm hating what's going on today. But if I'm not careful, a guy like me will start preaching and operating out of the hate that I have for the wrong that's going on in the world today, and I'll forget all about the height from which I've fallen. I'll forget all about what Jesus has done for me. I'll forget all about the good news for those who have not retained or ever even experienced what God has done for me and so many of you, and that story will get left by the wayside because I hate some of your religion. I hate your lifestyle. I hate the, what's going on 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 the left side of the fence. I hate COVID. I hate all these different things. What if a man was to preach out of the love of Christ? I'm going to bet you at one time in this town, I prayed for more homosexuals than all the rest of the preachers in this town put together. They're welcome here. Do I love you enough to tell the truth? God will restore your sexuality, your identity. He'll do all that. He's standing here telling you you're going to hell. All I can do with that is create a fear of hell the same way they created a fear of COVID. You think somebody got the jab because they knew so much about COVID? They got it out of fear. I mean, that's just a good statement. I'm not condemning anybody either way. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. And it's all in real time right now. I'm just saying, as the church, have, have I operated in condemnation and and tried to create fear? Or is it time for me to hear a nevertheless? Nevertheless, don't forget. I can hear him right now. Don't forget what a knothead you were. Don't forget. I kept score. Your scorecard's got a lot of junk on it. Look, it takes a special kind of preacher to know there's a guy smoking cannabis 50 yards from you. Just saying. Yeah, I got a history. I've even committed abominations. I remember when I used to worship a building. Where I thought there was something different about the articles of worship than the one to be worshipped. I'm just standing up here tonight having confession about a letter to the church because he wrote this letter to me. 
the first one in here. I don't know how the crud I'm going to get through the rest of them. Nevertheless, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now I'm going to ask the hardest question of the day before I read the last line. So if a man prayed the prayer because he was afraid, I was involved in a conversation this week where they thought hell needed to preach, be preached everywhere. The reality of hell needs to be preached. I simply explained that I've been preaching the reality of Jesus for 27 years and trying to live it in front of people where they might catch a whiff. If them same people won't believe that Jesus is real, why would they worry about hell being real? And if you can convince them that hell is real, will they call on Jesus out of love or call on Jesus out of fear? I think that's a valid question. I think that's how we filled football stadium altars for 40 years and America got dumber. On our journey to heaven, while we escape hell, the Bible says, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Did Jesus draw you to him? Because the Bible says all men are drawn. It's the love of Christ that draws men unto himself. Not the fear of hell. The love of Christ. He who fears has not been made perfect. How many of you would agree today that the body of Christ in America would be operating less than perfect and have a couple neverthelesses in our program? Anybody agree with that? You think maybe we've bumped onto something? You think there's a chance that you've watched guys like me and listened to people like me who may have took for granted the height from which they've fallen? Forgot about the things we love first and what Jesus has done for us? To the point that I was just a preaching old grumpy white guy. I didn't have to tell anybody. Remember when Beto O'Rourke come over here? I said, hey, you're in West Texas. I'm a white guy in a starch white shirt and a cowboy hat. What do you think about me? He said, I know who you are. He said, uh, I spotted you when I come in the door. <laughs> huh. So his first thought was, I was a conservative. God, I hope when we were done that day, his second thought was that I was a Christian. Do I need the whole world to know what they're doing wrong, or do I need them to know that I'm a Christian? Not because of what I say or where I park my car or my carcass. Because the love of Christ has made me perfect affected my life am I perfect no the love of Christ has perfected my life my perfection is found in Jesus he took my sin and he gave me my life my family all of this all of that Be the guy who gets to hold a microphone and sell one for a million five. You remember I told you the first two, ten man was 500,000. That's four years ago. Three years ago was would she be tough. Two years ago was would he be tough. And I can't tell you none of their names this year. <clears throat> this ain't that big a deal. 
loving Jesus, that's a big deal. Remembering every day what he's done. We love him, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. You want to remember your first love? Remember, you were his first love. That'd go good on some kind of Easter card or something. You were Jesus' first love. And because of the things you love, something you cared about, did you cry out to him and say, save me, help me, restore my life? I have never met anybody. I've been with thousands of people who've cried out to Jesus. I've never been with anybody that said, Jesus, save my soul because I want to die today. I did lead, I did, I did help one one day in his 11th hour. He was 90-something years old. And he had just scoffed at me for a long time around that old sail barn. I don't know why God's reminding me of this. And I went to his hospital room a couple times. I just sat with him. Miami. Good guy. Just didn't care nothing about what we were doing. I said, Limey, would you like to meet Jesus? I sure would. I said, let me ask him. I know him. I said, Limey, he hears me. Let me ask him if you can meet him. And I sat in that hospital room. And I watched a 90-something-year-old man meet the creator of the universe with my own eyes. Preached his funeral. Pastor of that church had never had heard the story told that way, but in the Bible it tells of a story where there's a group of workers sitting down at the market square, and the, and the master comes by, and he gives them a day's wage to go work, and then he comes back later on in the afternoon and gets some later in the day, gives them the same wage. Then he comes by at the 11th hour and gets him a group of guys and gives them the same wage that he gave the guys that had been there all day. And the guys that had been there all day, they were griping and complaining, said, They've only been here for a short time. You picked them up at 11 o'clock. Why would you give them the same as you gave me? And the master said, did you not agree to the wage? And they said, yes. Then what difference is it to you? For the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of God that was everything that each one of us have dealt with today in our own personal lives. He knows the frustration. He knows the uncertainty of the future. He knows every nickel of it. Tonight, he's using me to speak in our language the hope of remembering what Jesus gave back to you. What you loved more than yourself and Jesus said, here, come, all who are weary, all who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, rest for your souls. Your soul will not rest in frustration, but you will prosper. In peace. That's all I got tonight. Probably said enough, didn't I? Good. What do y'all say we pray and quit? Everybody got plenty to think about this evening? Got any neverthelesses? Oh.
I want to ask Robin if she'll help me remember mine. <laughs> but I don't know if I dare. She's the only one I know that doesn't have any nevertheless. <laughs> no, the we all fall short. It's hard not to get tangled up. Some of this is darn hard to watch. Everything that's under my authority, I'm going to fix it. Under the instruction of God the best I can. And when he gets out of my arm's reach, all I can do is pray to the owner of the universe. I don't know that he'll fix it either. So maybe I just need to pray that, hey, God, you help me remember when me and you first met. Before I was right. Can you help me remember before I was right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes being dumber than a stump all the time ain't that bad a deal, you know? So, let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you tonight for loving us first. So good, so gracious, and you truly take care of your people. Lord, there's a lot of people out there that are not your people. Lord, they're, they're so influenced by the prince of the air. Lord, a lot of this is just really hard to watch. So, Lord, give us eyes for you. Eyes for your kingdom. Let's have ears to hear, Lord, that we would be directed to navigate through all this stuff in a way that glorifies you and let some of those who are not kingdom people become kingdom people. That they would come to know you, Jesus, that their lives be restored. Help us remember daily, Lord, it's not enough just to do all the right things and hate what's bad. We got to remember what we love. Got to stay soft towards you. Not soft in our demeanor, bold, as your word says. But we can only be perfected in love. Can't be perfected in our performance, Lord, I get that. We can't be perfected in just being right, I get that. Be perfected in love, and perfect love drives out all fear. Lord, I love that. Lord, tonight I just speak that over everyone here. In the midst of bad reports or bad timing or whatever, speak that. Perfect love drives out all fear. We are all made perfect in love. Bless you tonight, Lord. For your life, death, and resurrection you gave all of us a second chance. Be glorified in how we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hope somebody got a little something out of that tonight. We'll still be in the church of Ephesus next week, I'm sure, one more time. And maybe by then we can move on to the next one. I, I do want to encourage you, not because we're, you know, I don't concern myself with the numbers. Maybe next week we're going to give a little report. It's amazing what's come out of this little mess here like above and beyond like crazy that food pantry across the road and you'll hear about it again next week God did that so he could show off to this town that is all him and people who are guided by him and used by him all sizes flavors and denominations God's using he opened the spigot on both sides, customers and provision. It's like a flood. He wants to show off his kingdom. He's revealing his kingdom. These things are all coming out of here. So here's my deal. If you got somebody in your family that you love and care about that's searching a little bit, having a hard time figuring it out, he was a little cautious because he was afraid I might offend him with my politics or some of my stuff. You know, I always had my sword out jabbing somebody with it. I'm pretty sure God's working this out. 
where I'm more usable. Where we can bring our families and we can learn together. You can sit down at your kitchen tables on the other side of this deal and not have to grab your kids' ears every 15 minutes. Just teach the Bible under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So bring them. If you think we can help, bring them. That's all we want out of this is to help. That's it. So.